We've been dealing with something we call American Essentials. This is the third message in that series, and our main focus is on what the Bible has to say about the definition and purpose of freedom. Looking back, our first message was addressed to the issue of the proper use of freedom. It drew its focus from the letter of Paul to the Galatians, chapter 5, verses 13 through 18. That message says that we are not free to do as we please, but we are free to love and care for one another as members in the body of Christ. Our second message two weeks ago was on true freedom. It drew its focus from a conversation between Jesus and a group of Jews who followed him, but who were in a ludicrous state of denial. Jesus had said to them, unless the Son sets you free, you are not free. But if the Son sets you free, you are free indeed. Well, even these loyal followers of his who were Jews took exception. They said, we've never been a slave to anyone. They conveniently forgot that for several centuries they were slaves in Egypt. And then they were slaves in the relocation in Babylon when many of them were taken captive. And at the time they were having the conversation, their country was occupied by the Romans. So they were in a state of denial about what freedom they really had. Today we turn our attention to this passage in Deuteronomy chapter 10, where through Moses, God tells the people of Israel what the Lord requires of them. He spells it out for them here in chapter 10. But before that, Moses reminds them of just how close they came to God wiping them out. In the ninth chapter of Deuteronomy, he takes them back to the building of the golden calf and reminds them that God was so angry that he threw the tablets of the law down on the ground in disgust. And Moses did when he received them. And he had to go up to the mountain a second time and receive them again from God. I'm sure that Moses was embarrassed to have to return. And perhaps the ever patient God was a little annoyed. After all, those were days long before Xerox. Anybody awake? (laughs) I want to begin with a kind of prologue to this question of what God requires of a nation. Let's go back to the closing days of the year 1977. The United States Senate decided to confer a rare honor on one of its members. Just nine years before, he had been his party's candidate for president. Now he was very ill, dying of terminal cancer. They voted to name the new Health and Human Services building after him, and that had been the first time that a federal building was named for a living person. Hubert Humphrey delivered his last speech at the dedication of that building on November the 1st, 1977. Humphrey used a quote that is remembered to this day, 40 years later. Here is his quote. It was once said that the moral test of government is how that government treats those who are in the dawn of life, the children, those who are in the twilight of life, the elderly, and those who are in the shadows of life, the needy and the handicapped. For most of our 241 years of history, America in one way or another has been debating the question raised in Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 12. So now, O Israel, what does the Lord your God require of you? Down through almost two and a half centuries, we have debated such things as the scope of government and what we are to do for others. As citizens, we're not of all, all of one mind about these things. Just consider such things as immigration policy. Just consider such things as what we're going to do with health insurance. These are issues that are in the news every day. Some believe we are doing things and providing services 
that are far from what the framers of the Constitution ever can envisioned. They want the size and scope of government more narrowly defined, more limited. Some resonate to Hubert Humphrey's quote, and they want America to live up to the high ideals that they believe the founding fathers had for our nation. As people of faith, it is most appropriate for us to hear and consider what the Lord said to Moses and to the people of Israel and what the Lord God required of them. David Payne wrote a commentary on this chapter in Deuteronomy 10, and I found his review of it particularly helpful. After considering a number of past events, Payne writes, especially the surrounding Sinai law giving, the writer of Deuteronomy turns abruptly to his own day and generation and says, And now, Israel, what does the Lord your God require of you? It was and is a reasonable question, but the answers are right there. They're provided. Five requirements are given in verses 12 and 13. God's people should fear, love, and serve him. They should walk in all his ways and they should keep his commandments. Now, whenever we hear the word fear, we often go to fright and terror. But fear here means primarily reverence, because God loves Israel. He wishes to do them no harm. It's a kind of fear we have that if we disobey someone who we know cares about us, like a father or a mother, we know that there will be consequences when we get home. Reverence and love, then, are attitude that God looks for. They best show themselves in service, in worship, in obedience. To walk in God's ways is a comprehensive idea, Payne writes, really includes all the other demands. Verses 20 and 21 in this passage endorse these demands in different words. Here is your, he is your praise, Deuteronomy writes. He is the object of your praise. It's a further call not to neglect the worship of your God. God's awesome greatness is highlighted in verses 14 and 17. In order not to terrify his people, but induce them. Induce their wonder that the Almighty Creator has set his heart in love upon Israel in particular. The generation reading these words understood that. Now I want to stop right there in terms of what Payne is saying and begin to apply this to us people in this station. There are very few in our nation who don't wonder from time to time why of all the billions of people born into this world, am I privileged to live in this place and enjoy these blessings and these opportunities? That's the same thing, really, that Moses was saying to the people of Israel. He was saying, God set his heart and eye upon you in a very special way. He chose you. He called you. He blessed you. We know it. And as we so often remark and remember, it's the immigrants among us, those who recently arrived, who understand this far better than those of us who've been here for some generations. There's a wonderful story about Will Rogers, who was speaking to an assembly of uh, people who were descendants of those who came on the Mayflower, some of the first col colonists to arrive in America. And after they listed all of the people and all of the descendants who were present, he said, well, I'm from Oklahoma and I'm part Indian, so when your relatives arrived here, some of my relatives were here to say hello. Unless we're Native American, we're immigrants. We came from someplace else. And God has blessed us with many opportunities. The thing I hope we come away from, with in this passage in Deuteronomy chapter 1 is how strongly the passage points 
to the care of what he calls the sojourner or the stranger. Let's go look again at what it says. The Lord has set his heart in love on your ancestors alone and chose you, their descendants after them, out of all the peoples as it was today. Circumcise then the foreskin of your heart, Moses says, and do not be stubborn any longer. For your Lord God is the God of God and the Lord's of God, Lord of God. He executes justice for the orphan and for the widow and loves the stranger and provides for them food and clothing. You also, as it says in verse 19, are to love the stranger. For you were once strangers in the land of Egypt. One of the biggest debates going on, and it's been going on a long time, is what do we do about people who want to come to this nation? And for the longest time, we had a very open-hearted policy. But in recent years, we've become very concerned about whether perhaps the resources are stretched and the ability to absorb more and more people are now limited. Well, it probably won't surprise you to remind you of one of the greatest pieces of literature. It's called the New Colossus. It's on the base of the statue Statue of Liberty in the New York Harbor. Here's what Emma Lazarus wrote back in 1883. Not like the brazen giant of Greek frame, fame, with conquering limbs astride from land to land, here at our sea-washed sunset gate shall stand a mighty woman with a torch, whose flame is the imprisoned lightning, her, hand, her name the mother of exiles. And from her beacon hand glows worldwide welcome. Her mild eyes command the air-bridged harbor that twin cities frame. Keep, ancient lands, your storied pomp, cries she with silent lips. And then these words, which we so remember. Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free the wretched refuge of your teeming shore. Send these, the homeless, tempest-tossed to me. I lift my lamp beside the golden door. I'm not suggesting for a moment that the issues of immigration and safety are simple ones. They are not. They're complicated. But I am suggesting that if we keep in mind what God says to us in Deuteronomy chapter 10, and by the way, there are parallels to it in about four other places in the Old Testament, it will be a good way for us to remember what God requires of us. About a hundred years after Emma Lazarus wrote her words, 110, word, 110 years to be exact, a man named Neil Enlow, who is a musician and a poet, wrote an interesting piece set to music called The Cross is My Statue of Liberty. It reminds us of what Emma Lazarus said, but it adds a feature. It adds how all of this works with God in the mix. In the New York Harbor stands a lady with her torch raised to the sky. And all who see her know she stands for liberty for you and me. I'm proud to be called an American, to be named with the brave and the free. I will honor our flag and our trust in God and the Statue of Liberty. On lonely Golgotha stands a cross with my Lord raised to the sky, and all who kneel there live forever as all that saved 
all the saved can testify. I'm glad to be called a Christian, to be named with the ransomed and whole. As the statue liberates the citizen, so the cross liberates the soul. Oh, the cross is my statue of liberty. It was there that my soul was set free. Unashamed, I'll proclaim that a rugged cross is my statue of liberty. As a Wesleyan church writer has been saying for some years now, the world and our nation needs our voice, our uniquely Christian, God-fearing voice. We need to not let the decisions that are being made be made with our silence, our two cents worth in where this nation goes and what direction we take and what is required of us. Our voice needs to be heard. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for all that we enjoy, for all that is ours to, we are privileged to enjoy. We know that we are blessed often beyond measure and beyond what we can comprehend. And yet we know to whom much is given, much is required. We'd ask you to help us to live out our lives faithfully as members of the nation, as people of faith. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.